said last evening that I was going to explain something about the sanctuary. The sanctuary has been brought into operation by spiritual guidance. It has the foundation of true healing. Now, we know that there are thousands of healers in the world that have passed beyond this physical world but are still in the world and are aiding and helping everyone who wants help. These healers have a spiritual organization through which the work is done. Long ago I was told to organize this throughout the world, but I took my time, you know what I do. One feels that time is not ready and so forth, and you've got so much to do. But then I began to feel the influence behind this great spiritual effort. And it was begun. Now, when a person wants aid and help, the name is put on a register. Immediately it is put on that register, it is taken into a spiritual register. And there, spiritual forces are working entirely in unison with the sanctuary here. When a person asks me for help, I directly work towards that end to give that help. But I also call into operation those spiritual forces that are working entirely in the spiritual world for the purpose of helping people. Therefore, this is not an entirely a physical organization, but a spiritual organization. That is why so many miraculous things have taken place. I could go on all night trying to explain it. But if you will see the fundamentals that I want to show you is that when a name is placed upon the register for healing, it's immediately transferred to a spiritual register. It is taken by those spiritual forces who are working in harmony and in unison with us. And then forces are detailed to assist that individual, no matter in what part of the world they may be. I have been trained in this work to move also in the astral, so that I can help when necessary. But if you knew the many thousands of spiritual helpers, you'd be amazed. Thousands of them are working for the benefit of people all over the world. Now, I hope that will give you some idea of what it is. Lecture 6. The sixth step. Part the mind plays in relaxation. Relaxing the eye muscles. With thee is the foundation of life. In thy light shall we see light. Psalms 36, 9. There is no doubt that the mind plays a major part in relaxation, and it is necessary to understand what takes place. What we think is transferred to the cerebrum, and then transferred to the nerves and muscles of the body. This is an all-important fact we have to remember when relaxing, and to know this prevents what is known as the reverse effort. When we think, when we have an emotion, 
Immediately we have an emotion. The cerebrum becomes operative at once. It carries those messages back into the body. And the muscles become tense. That is the cause of most of our trouble. When those muscles become tense, they set up a reaction in the cerebellum at the back here, which causes a misbehavior. And this behavior continues until you begin to release the tension in the various muscles of the body. Some people, when trying to relax, find that their muscles become more tense. This is because they have not understood how the mechanism works. That is why I have laid emphasis on divine reasoning as a very necessary factor in relaxation. For if the mind is caught up in the strain of modern life, this strain is conveyed to the nerves and muscles, and this is the cause of tension, which is the seed of emotional habit patterns. Now you will easily see what happens. When the mind is caught up in the strain of modern life, fear, emotion, anxiety, envy, anger, all these emotions become part and parcel of you and are transferred immediately to the body. When the mind is in a state of harmony, this harmony is conveyed to the brain and body. There is a superphysical structure which interpenetrates the brain and body. And this structure is affected before the physical structure. And the change begins within and moves outwardly. Interpenetrating every physical thing, there is a natural fall. Science has proved that matter itself is but energy. Energy is nothing more but intelligence in action. And intelligence in action is the mother which is manifesting through the whole of all things. The womb in which things take place. But consciousness is the directing factor in this. And what your consciousness thinks causes the effect to take place in this inner structure that interpenetrates the brain and body. And there you have movement in the inner realm before you have movement in the outer. The change begins within and moves outwardly. When the consciousness is free from strain through divine reason, then the body is ready to obey the dictates of the mind. You must remember that the perfect state always exists. It is only when we upset this harmonious expression that we feel the result of our own reactions in the external world. How are you free from strain? By divine reason. You begin to get a glimpse of something that is beyond. Something that you do not know what it is, but you know that it is. Something that is behind all creation and is the only reality. That very reality is in yourselves and is your own reality. When divine reasoning comes to the fore, we find that there is a calmness comes over the mind and strain disappears. Your mind
mind and brain and to penetrate each other and act together. Their nature is to receive and record the effect any idea or object has upon them. Therefore we have to be alert so as to discern clearly and wisely so that these effects are modified in accordance with our state of mind. The nature is to receive and record the effect any idea and object have upon them. Your previous experience has a lot to do with it. A child, when he's growing up, is not afraid of the fire because he's not experienced the burn. But as you grow, you find through experiences the various things in life, the things that hurt you. And then the effect of these things and the idea of these things are registered in your mind. But if this fear becomes a dominant thing in your life, it will become the basic fear of everything. And what happens is this, that everything you touch and feel and look at, there is a fear. Divine reasoning releases that fear. And it's the only thing that can do it. That's why relaxation alone is not sufficient. You must have divine reasoning as the pillar to help you over the fear, the experiences of life. Therefore, we have to be always consciously alert, discern clearly and wisely so that these effects are modified in accordance with our state of mind. The vibrations that you have fixed in your mind continue to express themselves outwardly. If we fear anything or if we enjoy anything, these are reflected on our outer structure. This is well-known fact which each and every one has had experience. And it is for this reason that these lessons on scientifically controlled conscious relaxation is being given. This technique has been the means of freeing thousands of tension and effects created by themselves. If there was ever in this world a technique that could be given to the ordinary individual to relieve himself of his troubles, this is it. I have not yet found any technique that could match it. Relaxation and divine reason. It is nearly 40 years ago since I started relaxation. I knew the great work of relaxation. I remember in the First World War, I was on the medical staff of the Millennium Camp in Edinburgh, and there were quite a number of shell shock cases, and I had great success with them. I put them in different huts. And I treated them with relaxation. But I also give them the key to their own existence. And to my amazement, these fellows got well. I'll always remember one fellow. He was having fits every day. And nothing could be done for him. I took him in hand, and with the first fit he had, <coughs> I pressed the back of his neck and 
put his hand back so that it would break the spell. Because we know this is one of the main prayer centers of the body. The next day I treated them, the following day I treated them, and each day I treated them. And you know that that fellow never had another thing. I knew then that relaxation was a key to something. And since then, I have proved to experience in treating people all over the world. When the consciousness is free from strain, for divine reason, then the body is ready to obey. One great truth we must remember is that the perfect mind cannot hold any imperfection, otherwise it could not be perfect. And knowing this has helped us to overcome all our imperfections. We are producing through our mind and brain pictures which we hold in regard to conditions, events, people, etc., and according to the intensity of the emotion attached to these pictures we create, so does it cause tension in the nerves and muscles of the body. I want you to see the connection between your thinking and your body, the thinking and the tensions you create. And once you see the mechanism, the action that's taking place, you'll be able to remove them. You'll understand what's taking place. The method of how we can release these tensions that cause all sorts of effects upon our organism is of the greatest importance to all. Therefore, a knowledge of the cause is most necessary. And that is why I have chosen this sixth step to enlighten you on this very consequential subject. Most people are visualizing the things they do not want through fear of them. Can you understand what that means? With the result that they are manifesting them, the things most Fear are social, and economic, and not physical pain, and it is here that suggestions take a hand in creating conditions, even in our physical bodies, which we deplore. The fact is, you do not fear so much physical pain, but you fear those things that are social and economic. But these things bring about physical pain, bring about tensions, which bring about ulcers, heart troubles, and a number of other complaints. We suggest to ourselves every day, day after day, the same routine goes on in the mind, the same mental grind. No wonder that the body is tensed by emotional habit patterns. If you can see what you're doing, I've always told you to discern what you're doing, and you can remove and dissolve it. That is why relaxation is the antidote to tension, because relaxation is suggestion in its best form. It does not create the reverse effort that is often encountered when strong suggestions are made directly to remove a symptom. That is very important. <coughs> I have told you that strong suggestions do not bring about the thing that you want. 
but quiet suggestions do. If you tell a person, do this, do that, he runs his back and goes in the opposite direction. Or you always feel the heel rising on his back, telling you that he won't do it. I remember well when Cooey expounded his theory on suggestion. And by his method he cured all manner of people of their troubles. His method was not by strong suggestion, but by quiet, smooth, unobtrusive suggestion. And it is these small, unobtrusive suggestions that bring the patient out of the difficulties. Now here was Cui's method in a nutshell. The patient was instructed to lie quietly, as relaxed as possible, until a dreamy state was attained. In this dreamy state, the patient had to repeat 20 times, day by day, in every way, I'm getting better and better. Now, I see, to a great extent, what has happened. Kui already found that by using direct suggestions of the opposite of the trouble, the trouble invariably got worse. But by relaxed method he scored great success. But it was not relaxation at that time. He was aware of what we call strong suggestions bringing up the trouble more and more. If you said then, my foot is getting better and better, my foot is getting better and better, it only brought up the idea of Food. But in this state of quiet, peaceful relaxation, and the slow, easy method of the words, day by day, I'm getting better and better. And thousands of people all over the world were cured at that time. Why, the newspapers were full of it. But I, I know that Kui did not know the real cause of the cure. Now we can realize what happened. This quiet, unobtrusive suggestion became auto-suggestion. Unless suggestion becomes auto-suggestion, there is nothing done. That is why, with relaxation, so many wonderful results are obtained. This simple method induces auto-suggestion and the trouble begins to disappear. The brakes are taken off and nature takes the hand. I am not making the wild statement that relaxation or auto-suggestion alone is the cure. Nature does the work when we take off the brakes. But I do affirm that relaxation and other suggestions the best means whereby nature is enabled to do the work. Father does the work when we take off the brakes. I have not seen anything simpler yet. Nature is simple in our action. If we help her, she will do her work. When the mind discerns the false and the cause of its manifestation, then 50% of the trouble is conquered because 75% of our troubles are increased by the fear of them. Now, read that carefully and put it in your pipe and smoke it for a little while and see what it will bring out. When the mind is there as a false and the cause of its manifestation, then 50% of the trouble is conquered. Because 75% of our troubles are increased by the fear of them. Therefore, the mind has a tremendous influence upon our health, 
or ill health. In the mind also there are many opposing forces that prevent the idea of health being transformed into action. These opposing forces are released through our cropping, through free association which we talk of the other evening. In the mind there are fears through experience. If you are caught in a motor accident, or you are caught in the street, the motor knocked you down, you'd be afraid to cross the street. You'd always look up and down. Even when you were in the street, you'd be afraid lest the motor was coming along. If you were caught in a house that was on fire, you'd always want the doors to be opened because you want an escape. All these experiences are in your mind. They are the opposing forces to your health. If you do not know them, if you do not bring them to the consciousness and deal with them, there will still be a fear that prevents your health from being 100%. Now, this is not completely understood. This state is a state of mind that is a lengthy passive. The pleasant and the unpleasant must be viewed with impartiality until the whole content of the mind is known. The private thoughts, secret motives, intentions, bondages, and desires, all these must be known, must be seen, and as you see them as relative things, you will see them as thoughts, emotions, conditions that can in no way interfere with the spirit when it knows its own power. When the spirit knows its own power, it recognizes all things relative to it. That power then is added. This will reveal a knowledge of the self, and without self-knowledge there can be no understanding. Perception must be free from comparison <coughs> and judgment. Neither must you seek comfort or security. Neither must you seek to conform to any idea. If you do, then your free association begins to stop. Perception must be free from comparison and judgment. Neither must you seek comfort or security. True discernment of what is in the mind can only be acquired by free association through impartiality. If you can then see everything and look upon everything in your life, whether it is private or not, you can discern it, you can dispose of it. It shall no longer have any effect upon your health. That is the freedom of the mind. My God, if you could only see a free mind. As a matter of fact, I always see a free mind in children. It reminds me, I had a story of the other day of the boys at school. The teacher was giving them a lesson in scriptures. And as you know, Timotheus and Titus were contemporaries of Paul. So the teacher asked the boys, what did Timothy say to Paul when he appeared at the door? One boy said, 
In a loud voice, he says, if I'd known you were coming, I'd have baked a cake. <laughs> <laughs> so in, in the continuum of the conversation, the teacher was flummergasted, but he asked another question. He said, uh, what did Paul write to uh, Titus when he told him he was coming? He says, California, here I come. <laughs> <laughs> So the teacher packed up and finished. <laughs> that was the vision of the teacher for the day. <laughs> that was a good Bible lesson, I can assure you. The best Bible lesson I ever had. <laughs> Automatic writing is a means of revealing what is the content of the mind. When automatic writing first begins, there is much dribble. Confused thought expressed. But this should not stop you, as each layer of the mind is revealed, we reach a state when true thought begins to express itself. There are many people who have tried automatic writing and attribute to the unseen, but more often it is the content of the subconscious that are being expressed. And not until the whole of the contents of the subconscious is expressed can you have true spiritual writing. It sometimes takes five and six years for a person to be a real automatic writer. For instance, Mabel Cummins, who wrote Paul and Art, through automatic writing. That book was criticized everywhere, but no flow could be found. Historians took it, pierced into it, but they found that every fact was true. This woman knew nothing at all about Paul, where he was. She was just a person who had practiced automatic writing for about seven or eight years. When the mind is cleared of all the rubbish, and there's a lot of rubbish in it, then you will find real thoughts, thoughts of the spirit manifesting through you. Knowing of all things can come through the mind of the individual because it is linked with the universe. In this revealing, there must be no conflict with opposites, for these are but images in the mind which must be deserved. Freedom comes through discernment of what is in the mind. You have to discern what is in the mind. The emotions, the motives, the causes of all these things. Freedom comes through discernment of what is in the mind. What a wonderful statement that is, but nevertheless a true one. Emotion is often the main cause of spontaneous suggestion that takes root in the mind. The emotion of fear always surrounds the idea of trouble, disease or accident, as well as economic and social problems. The mind that is free is pliable, but a rigid mind full of fixed ideas is truly ignorance. When an idea is accepted by the mind, it causes certain cells of the brain to become active. The brain is the instrument through which the physical contact is made. And through the cells of the brain, a definite effect is created upon the corresponding part of the body 
creating action there according to the intensity of the idea held or the emotion. That's where we see how these conditions come about in the body. Impulses are thus created, carried along the nerves to any part of the body. The cell structure is mind, substance, in a negative phase of action, interpenetrated by a mental activity which is mind in a positive phase of action, the one interpenetrating the other. Thus a change in the tissue structure takes place. What a simple explanation. I want you to read this lesson. Read it over and over again until such time as you become aware of the facts here. Because if you do not become aware of those facts, you will never rid yourself of your troubles. You must know the mechanism that causes all your troubles. The mechanism through which it can you now visualize what a free mind is? This is a mind in which there is no opposites, no division, no separation, no bias, no prejudices, no antagonisms, no fear. Let us see then what a free mind is. It is a mind in which there is no opposites, no opposing forces. There is no two ideas battling one another, making a battleground of your mind, such as fear and faith, or any other thing. No division. That there can be no division whatsoever in any part of the universe. There can be no division upset in the mind. There can be no sense of separation. There can be no bias, no prejudices, no antagonisms, no fear. A free mind is not an easy thing to get, but it can be got when you know the mechanism and the way to get it. Discerning continuously every movement of the mind, every antagonistic thought, every sense of separation, every fear, not to banish these things or try and push them out of your mind, because that pushes them further into your mind. You've got to understand the cause of these things. I wish I had time to go further into this great subject, but as I have to give you instructions on how to release your eye muscles, this must be left for some future lesson. The eye is the window of the soul. Tense eye muscles reveal a tense body. To relax the eye muscles also tends to relax the body muscles. I know from experience what eyes are. During the First World War, I lost this eye. But this eye was also blind. And for a considerable time, I did not get my sight back. But I worked diligently through exercise. And I still have to be careful because of the muscles of this eye. Unless I understand macular vision, I wouldn't be able to read.
Little do you know the difficulty and the trouble I've had to make my sight come as good as I can read any word you wish. But at one time, I couldn't see a single thing. But I'm telling you this, that once you are able to use macular vision and relaxation, you can bring your eyes back to normal. When you find that your eyes are strained, you close them for a little while. You allow them to close naturally and easily in a lazy fashion so that the muscles become relaxed. But if you spread your vision, then there is trouble. I look at one person after another, but to look at the whole of you at once, I would immediately destroy this eye. When I look, when I am reading, I look at the word, one word after another. Therefore, I am able to bring the muscles of the eye back to normal. Therefore, I read easily, without effort, through macular vision. Now, there are six muscles attached to each eye to turn the eye from side to side and up and down. There are other finer muscles that expand and contract the iris of the eyeball to obtain the proper vision. Most people seldom use the eye muscles to any extent, thereby making them rigid. When they want to look at the side or up or down, they turn their heads. When reading, they try to read the whole line at a time, resulting in a strain of the finer muscles of the iris and those that control the focusing of right. I could not read. If I looked more than a, a few words at once, I'd immediately destroy the sight of his eye. Little do you know how difficult it is sometimes for me to read and write as I do, book after book, lecture after lecture. But by practice, I know what can be done. So therefore, I'm not speaking from out of books. I'm speaking from practical experience that you can also acquire the same wisdom and knowledge and bring the sight back again. Exercises have been given for the working of these muscles, such as moving the eyes round a square and across a square, diagonally in each direction, this undoubtedly helps to exercise the muscles. But if these muscles are still rigid, more harm is done than good. So before you exercise at all, you must relax your muscles of your eyes. And the best way to relax them is to bring your hand upon your eye and feel as if the eye is falling out into your hand. Put your finger across your eye here and try and bring about the periphery, those small muscles here, you'll feel them relaxed. Then as you get them relaxed, then the inner muscles begin to relax. Now here is the exercise that relaxes the eye muscles. Sit at a table with a cushion under your elbows. Place your hands cupped over your eyes and feel as if your eyes are falling into your hands. 
If you have any kind of eye trouble, no matter what it is, this exercise will help you greatly. You just do like this. For instance, we will say that this is chair and here is a table. You have a cushion here which your elbows are on so that it doesn't hurt you. Now you, you do this. Close your hands so that no light of any kind will come in. And you can sometimes open your eyes and look into the darkness in your hand. That helps a great deal to relax the eye, looking into the darkness in your hand with your eye open. Then close your eyes and say to your muscles of your eyes, relax. Relax, relax, relax. After your eye muscles are relaxed, practice moving your eyes from side to side gently at first because the eye muscles will contract again when moved strenuously. Do not tire the muscles. Go slowly at first. Again, a strong suggestion gets you the opposite of what you want. Strenuous exercises interfere and make your eyes more rigid. The next most important exercise to use is macular vision. That is to keep the focus moving around the smallest part, never staring. Take a word and move your focus round each letter. Then practice reading word after word. When you do this, you will find how easy it is to read without glasses. This exercise relaxes the eye, finer muscles. Staring or straining then causes tension. I am using macular vision all the time. When I look at a letter here now, T, for instance, and I go around the T, up and down the bottom, and I look away in the distance also at macular vision, at a T in the distance, a sign somewhere, on a building, a T out there, and I follow the outside line of the T. Then I come back and look at the T again here, and I do the same over there again. That is short and long focus, macular vision. When I look at V, I take the T at C. Then I can look at you, or you, or you, quite easily. The eye is not straight. It brings the muscles back into occupation. But if I immediately try to see the whole of you at once, I would go completely blind. That's how I have to be careful with this eye. It has to do a lot of work yet, because I'm going to live another 20 years yet. <laughs> and I'm going to write a good many more books yet. And I'm going to write a good many more lectures yet. And I'm going to heal a lot of more people yet. <laughs> and lots of other things that I do. Having a glass of whiskey at a time, doing all those things that makes life worth living. You've got to be happy in this world unless you're not happy in it, but you should be in it at all. I saw the other day people come from the church with their head coming down and they were walking slowly and slowly. They were looking side to side. Very I said, if, if that's religion, God could be. <laughs> Get out into the fields and the flowers and the trees and see God there everywhere. Why were they like that? Because of the fact all the world had that day was sin, damnation, and hell. I say, if there is a hell, 
Well, it must be in heaven, because there's no other place. If God is infinite in nature, there can be nowhere where he is not, otherwise he could not be infinite. That there is a hell, God is there in hell himself. Hell and heaven are states of consciousness. There is no such place, and children are taught, even today, that they'll be burnt in hell, they'll be stuck with fox, all these sort of rubbish. I saw a book the other day <laughs> of Adam and Eve, all the various stories children were taught, and he was Adam and Eve underneath a tree, and the apples were falling down. <laughs> when Eve grabbed the apple and she and it over to Adam, you see? And here you see the pictures of all this thing going on. How awfully stupid. And then, a little further on, you can see a big furnace. And the devil there with a long tail and a fork. See, waiting for people to come down. <laughs> as bad as the story of Sandy, he went up to heaven and he, he couldn't get any further, but he got to the gate. And Peter met him and he says, what do you want here, Sandy? He says, I want to get in. Why, he says, you never did a good turn in your life. Oh, yes, said Sandy, I put sixpence in the poor box once. <laughs>